From 1918 until 1991, the South Slavic nations of the Western Balkans were united under a single sovereign state. But far from being a happy union, Yugoslavia was rife with division, not just at its end, but from the very start. In the chaotic aftermath of World War I, the fledgling country had to balance competing ideals of local representation and strong state authority in a dangerous world. So then, who wanted Yugoslavism to become a reality? How did they try to implement it? Who tried to stop them, and why? In one of the most diverse parts of Europe, just how did Yugoslavia form? Well, Yugoslavism, or Yugoslav nationalism, was the idea that three Slavic ethnic groups, the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, were all branches of one people. Proponents of Yugoslavism called them the Yugoslav tribes, and when war broke out in 1914, they were spread across four countries. By the end of World War I, though, that would change. By autumn 1918, the Allies had liberated Serbia and Montenegro from three years of occupation by the Central Powers, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was crumbling, and its many, many ethnicities were using that chance to make a break for it. Austria-Hungary's South Slavs organized a provisional state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, and declared independence from the failing empire. Around the same time, Montenegro joined with Serbia, and Allied forces continued into Hungary. In November, at Geneva, the head of the Provisional State's National Council, Anton Korosic, and the Serbian Prime Minister, Nikola Pašić, agreed that they would form a Yugoslav state under Serbia's leadership, but that would respect the autonomy of the lands coming together to form it. Then, the actual creation of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, Yugoslavia, as it was officially renamed a decade later, was declared on December 1st, 1918. Of course, in practice, declaring a state and really having one are two different things. First of all, the exact borders of the kingdom weren't established until after the treaties of Saint-Germain, Trianon, and Rapallo. But more importantly, Yugoslavists had the mammoth task of trying to unite all sorts of people who had lived apart for centuries, and accordingly had different customs, languages, religions, alphabets, legal codes, and economic interests. So the new state had to wrestle with exactly what Yugoslavism's implementation would mean. For most ethnic Croats and Slovenes, especially the Croatian Peasant Party, or HSS, led by Stjepan Radic, Yugoslavia had to be a federation, if it was going to exist at all. That was what was implicitly agreed to by their National Council and the Serbian government at Geneva, and the HSS specifically rejected Yugoslavism outright until 1925, really wanting an independent Croat Republic. The King of Serbia, Peter I, had been made King of Yugoslavia under the Geneva Deal, though his son, Crown Prince Alexander, was regent. Signing up to a Serb-led monarchy was definitely a compromise for most Croats, but they were hoping to ensure their security by giving up some sovereignty, particularly as Italy sought to expand in the Balkans. Federal Yugoslavism would have meant accepting the three tribes to be closely related but still distinct, and letting them govern their own provinces, mostly based on borders from pre-1918. Before unification, in the southeast of what became Yugoslavia were the ethnic Serb kingdoms of Serbia and Montenegro, while north of the Serb heartlands was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a personal union of Austria and Hungary, and the last iteration of the Habsburg monarchy. Serbia, which incorporated Montenegro in 1918, was a constitutional monarchy headed by the Karadjordjevic dynasty, and its politics was dominated by the Yugoslavist People's Radical Party. Virtually all Croats and Slovenes lived in the Hungarian Kingdom of Croatia Slavonia, some southern regions of Hungary, Austrian Dalmatian and Illyria, and the condominium of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Since 1868, the Croats had had their own parliament under the Hungarian crown. Plenty of ethnic Serbs also lived in Austria-Hungary, though. It was in Bosnia that the Serb nationalist Gavrilo Princip assassinated Austria's heir and kicked off the chain of events that started World War I. 
For Serbs of all backgrounds, the differences between the Slovene, Serb, and Croat tribes were a result of centuries of foreign imperialism, so to properly merge them back together, they wanted Yugoslavia to be a centralized or unitary state, and when a constitutional assembly was elected, they got their way. Ethnic Serbs would come to dominate Yugoslav politics. How did the new government set about implementing the Yugoslav vision? Well, by abolishing the provinces, and at the start, by acting as if differences between the South Slavs just didn't exist. National identities in the region were still evolving. Basically though, to identify Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, one can combine data on language and religion. Slovenes spoke Slovenian and were generally Catholic Christians. Croats were also mostly Catholic, but they spoke dialects of a close relative of Slovenian, the Serbo-Croatian language. Religion is the best, but hardly a perfect way to tell apart the Croats and the Serbs, who also spoke Serbo-Croatian and often lived with Croats in overlapping communities, especially in Bosnia. Most Serbs were Orthodox Christians, though. As for Serbo-Croatian, the language has half a dozen or so dialects that cross the lines between groups, but the key distinguisher was writing. Serbs usually wrote using a Cyrillic script, while Croats, as well as Slovenes, used the Latin alphabet. Ignoring most of that, the country's first census in 1921 wanted to make sure that everyone was a Yugoslav, so it cleverly didn't ask about national identification or even list separate language options for Serbs and Croats. That it did survey religion is why we can more or less tell who was who. The Yugoslavists also overlooked Macedonia and Bosnia, and official records make Yugoslavia's ethnic makeup look more like this. Macedonian Slavs were recorded as Serbs, despite the fact that they didn't see themselves that way and were more similar to Bulgarians. Muslim Slavs in Bosnia, the descendants of converts from centuries of Ottoman Turkish rule, were also officially lumped in with the Serbs and Croats, and on top of everything else, around a quarter of Yugoslavia's population weren't even tangentially connected with the Three Tribes idea. There were large German and Magyar minorities left over from the Habsburg era, ethnic Albanians around Kosovo, Turks in Macedonia, and a few Romanians in northern Serbia, among others. Frankly, the establishment of the Old Kingdom of Serbia didn't understand the strength of national feelings among Yugoslavia's non-ethnic Serbs. The constitution that they adopted in 1921 was boycotted by all the major Croat and Slovene political parties after seats in a constitutional assembly were disproportionately awarded to the Serbs. Still, for Yugoslavia's first decade, the expectation of Yugoslavist Serbs seemed to be that Croats and Slovenes would just naturally come around and become more Yugoslav by existing in their Yugoslav state. To try and facilitate that, the provinces were replaced with 33 small oblasts or administrative regions, unlike the provinces which before unification had either been independent or autonomous within Austria-Hungary, the oblasts were a means of exercising central control. The king and the government appointed a prefect to head each oblast, whose job was to keep local authorities in line and ensure compliance with laws enacted in the capital. On the ground, though, it turned out transforming half a dozen disparate regions into a single state can be difficult. The Croats, second only to the Serbs in population, put up a rigid defense of their culture. The Croatian Peasant Party won most of the Croat vote in every election in the 1920s. Only in urban Zagreb and Sarajevo was it challenged, but most Croats lived in the countryside. The HSS became almost a parallel state in Croat areas, refusing to carry out government decrees and organizing peasant communities, which provided education and economic support to the peasantry. It also organized a militia which competed with the official Yugoslav police, and in 1925 it briefly managed to get into a coalition government with the People's Radicals, forcing the Serb Yugoslavists to give the peasant communities a degree of official acceptance. All that work was designed to, and did, maintain Croat national identity. 
As one might expect, that did not make the central government all that happy. Actually, tensions were so high that a People's Radical deputy in the National Assembly went on a shooting spree on the floor of the chamber itself in 1928. He killed the leader of the opposition, the HSS's Stjepan Radic. To Serbs like the assassin, Croat or Slovene separatism threatened national unity, leaving the state divided and vulnerable. On the other hand, the Croats felt that they had been betrayed when a centralized Yugoslav state was established instead of a federal one. Yugoslavism, in a cultural sense, was never brought about then, and in the aftermath of Radic's assassination, the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes ditched even the pretense of equality for the tribes and banned public references to them or Yugoslavia's religious divides. In 1929, King Alexander tore up the constitution and ended what little autonomy non-Serbs had. The king officially renamed the country and ruled personally until 1931. He actually was shot dead in 1934, which didn't help matters. Afterwards, a one-party, Yugoslavist regime would rule Yugoslavia until its brutal occupation during World War II. Nationalism eventually did in the South Slav state, even totally reorganizing itself after the war only left Yugoslavia with borrowed time, but it was hardly the first country to succumb to internal division. To learn more about that, check out the video on the inner workings of Austria-Hungary to the left, or see a more constructive side of nationalism and find out how Romania managed to unite around the same time as Yugoslavia. As always, thanks for watching Look Back History, and hopefully I'll see you there.